All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is John Kranz with Constant Press. I want to thank you all for uh, joining this presentation today. Uh, this is really part of the Constant World uh, webinar series, something we did a little over a year ago, and it was put on hiatus for a little bit, and we basically relaunched the webinar series uh, this week, just the time for the holidays. So uh, we'll look forward to uh, hosting uh, various sessions by all, all publishers out there on whatever games they wish to promote or or discuss with you and of course you're welcome if you have a seminar topic you'd like to present on uh, I'll be happy to help host and moderate for you if that's something you'd like to do um, so again welcome again it's been like I said it's been over a year so excuse me if it's a little informal or rough on the edges since it's been some time what we're going to do today is we're going to do a quick uh, demonstration of the hunters that's uh, the new release from uh, Consum Press which uh, started shipping a little over a week or two ago and again it's a real pleasure to to be speaking with you tonight. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through a live demonstration. We have two um, gaming platforms that we support for the Hunters today. And uh, by the way, you can play uh, the game completely uh, online using the computer. Um, the rules are available and in the, uh, in the uh, online uh, platform itself, whether it's Sensu or Vassal, uh, you can go ahead and you'll have all the materials you need to play the game. So that's what we're going to be doing a little bit today, but before we get started, I just want to ask you ask you all uh, just a few quick questions. So I had some poll questions I just wanted to go ahead just to get a, a sense of who I'm talking to. So what I'd like you to do is I'm going to throw up a poll question, and I'd like you to go ahead and answer it if you could. And I would just like to see what responses we get. And uh, this is basically to find out um, what's tricky today in the old days of SPI. <laughs> Or Avalon Hill, you'd have to write a letter and do a Q&A phrase with a yes or no simple answer. And, and now, you know, the challenge we have is we have uh, got the news desk, we've got Board Game Geek, we've now got a Facebook page that's very active, we've got our website for Consum Press. So I'm trying to get a take on where you're finding out about where the webinar was announced, just to see what uh, where basically we, we were able to reach you at. So uh, quite a few of you have voted already. So um, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. And let me see, I'm going to share that poll with you now. So I'm hoping that you can, uh, you can see the poll result. I'm not sure if it's actually displaying on the screen, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to trust this <laughs> if it's working. If not, I'll just tell you that uh, nearly half of you uh, found out about the webinar either through the Consum World News Desk or the Consum World Forum site and followed by a 32% on Board Game Geek, and then a, a much smaller percentage. Uh, oh, thanks for tell me that it's working. Thanks, guys. So you can see the results there. So I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to hide that poll question. We're going to move on to another question. So it's good to know that you know Board Game Geek and Consum uh, World Forum or News Desk. Uh, now, this is a really, this might be a touchy question for you, so be prepared, because I know the game is still mailing, but I have to ask this question. I want to find out if you've actually, if you have ordered the game, some of you have, and I understand that, and that's perfectly fine. And like I said, you can play the game now, even if you haven't ordered yet, if you want to get a, a flavor for it by using Sun Sewer Basil. So let's find out how many of you have actually received the game. So uh, again, we've got about 93% that have voted. So uh, happy to hear, uh, Kevin, that yours just arrived today, by the way. Thanks for telling me that. So I think a few did arrive today from uh, what I was seeing. So I'm going to close this poll and just, uh, I'll go ahead and share that result for you here as well. So uh, some unhappy campers in the house. So um, I apologize to you that you have not received the game yet. And uh, you know, I'll keep my fingers crossed you'll get it very soon. So uh, thanks again for letting me know that. And I promise this is the last question, but I need to know this because we're going to go through a live demonstration today. So I'm very curious since we had Vassal and Sun Tzu available for you to start playing the game already. I just want to get a sense of how many of you have actually tried playing the game already and have given the rules a try. So this is an interesting result here. So it's a little lower than I expected, but that's okay. So that's a good reason to have this session today. So I'm going to close this poll now so you can see the result. So as you can see here, we've had, um, again, uh, Almost 20% of you have actually played the game already, and that probably includes, I know we have John Gandera online right now, who a, was a great playtester for us, and I believe Jack Beckman is joining us, and Michael Sandberg, one of the rules proofers, etc. So I know some of you are involved in playtesting of the game, and, and thanks again for all your efforts on that. So with that, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to hide that poll, and I am hoping that the slide deck 
is showing right now. So I don't know if anybody can give me a quick word if you're seeing the slide deck right now or not, because we want to go back to, yes it is. Thank you so much, Scott, for letting me know. All right, so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to be jumping into Sun Tzu. So uh, that is one of the platforms that's available for the game. So we've uh, props to Bill Barrett, who did the Sun Tzu module, uh, or Game Box, rather, for the Beta Farm release we did way back in 2010. So this is really all you need to play the game. So um, one of the design goals from Greg Smith was to make this game a small footprint for you as, as the solitaire player. So quite literally, uh, you, gonna, you will be uh, commanding, as you both command on, you'll be commanding a single U-boat. That's your display on the left. And the patrol area, which is where you actually conduct your assigned patrols, is that bottom area. And then to the right, we included a combat mat, which is used to resolve uh, combat against, uh, obviously, your ship targets. And then when you're up against escorted ships, in particular, that's the most involved process uh, in the game. So we decided to go ahead and put an outline together for you there. What's really nice about the game is that things become transparent over time as you play it, and, and probably as others can uh, attest to, you're not going to be referring to the rules a lot or even to the outline to the right once you get rolling with how the game plays. So this is really it. This is your footprint for the game. Now with that said and how the Sun Tzu module was done, I want to show you all the other uh, pieces of the puzzle that come into play. So what we're doing here is I've got, and I, I, I do like this approach that Bill took with Sun Tzu. So he gave me a tabletop metaphor. Now obviously I'm not going to have all my tables spread out. They're going to be, yeah, literally probably stacked on top of each other. So I'm not going to have them spread out like this. But we have, starting from the left, we have our main uh, player aid cards uh, that will be used. And these are double-sided, uh, obviously, the ones that you're getting with the physical game. In this case, they're not double-sided in this, uh, in this uh, uh, Sun Tzu set. So you're seeing more pieces of paper, basically, in this case, because everything's single-sided. So what's really nice about this platform, and basically for game demonstration purposes, is we've got the dice here just handy up upper left-hand corner, and we're, while we focus in on uh, doing our patrols right here, we can easily just jump to whatever chart we need or to the target list uh, here to the right uh, as we're resolving combat. So that's, uh, I really like this uh, setup, so I, I hope it works well for the demo today. Um, I know Basil's available, but I just feel a little bit more at ease using this, a little bit quicker on the fly, so let's, let's go ahead and uh, and get started. And I'll, I'll double check. I hear from Bill that the Sun Tzu module is broken. The link's um, not working to the Sun Tzu module. So I will, uh, I'll double check that to make sure that's working for you all so you can download that from our uh, Constant Press website. So what I'd like to do for the live demonstration is we're going to go ahead and we're going to start. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick my Type 7C U-boat. Uh, and that's what we're going to start with for purposes of today's uh, demonstration. This, by the way, is the same U-boat model I used in about three or four hours of recorded um, sessions that are available. If you go to the Constant Press site, you have about three hours of tutorials that we broke out into separate uh, screenings for you to help you get into play. So what I'm going to do in the next 20, 25 minutes is I'm going to try to go through two to three hours of content and actually play the game live at the same time. Yeah, good luck to me, right? So uh, that's basically how we're going to do this. Now, the patrol log is not on the display here, as you see. So for the patrol log, I'm just going to basically reference the patrol log. It's not part of Sun Tzu. Um, it's something you can download. However, we do have a PDF of the patrol log, which is available from the Constant Press website again. So for purposes of play, I mentioned again, we're going to start with the Type 7 CU boat. So when you do have a log sheet and you will be using it in the game, I'll be starting with this October 40 uh, call, uh, row. And I don't know if it's British Isles yet or not, what my patrol assignment's going to be. But basically, uh, the patrol log sheet is something that we will come back to uh, while I'm playing the game. It's just something I'm not going to fill out in real time. Uh, so just I wanted to make a quick reference to the log sheet. Uh, but we're going to focus on the gameplay with the materials we have here in Sun Tzu. So let's go ahead and get started. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is game setup. And according to the rules of play that we have, and you'll see that as far as the opening sections of the rules, uh, section 4.0 is, is all about game setup all the way through the initial torpedo loads, so on and so forth. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to start with the Type 7 CU boat available October of 1940. So uh, given that, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and take my U-boat marker, 
Uh, and I'm just going to put it in the import box. We haven't started our maiden voyage yet, our first patrol. So I'm just going to set it aside since we're not active in this patrol area yet. Uh, next thing I need to do is, uh, according to the roles, you have various ranks of your crew members. Uh, and uh, in the roles, as stated, there's, uh, by the way, it goes, starts from green all the way up to elite. And there's some uh, mnemonics on the counters to remind you of some die roll modifiers on the charts. But we're starting with train. I'm going to zoom in here a little better so you can see it. So we're going to start with a trained level of our crew quality, which basically means there's not going to be really any modifiers uh, during the patrol at a trained level. Uh, random events will happen during play if I roll uh, box cars, uh, double six um, with two siders. will trigger a random event, uh, but that has obviously not happened yet, so that remains blank. I don't have any Knight's Cross awards uh, as myself as the commandant because we're just starting the game. But I do have to check my starting rank uh, as uh, the commandant of the U-boat. And per the rules, I do need to roll for that. So just to show you where that is, and I'm actually... Uh, going to actually flip over here now uh, to the rules that are available online uh, to the game, just on the back page itself. Uh, we'll go there. We have uh, what we call the starting rank uh, of U.S. Commandant. And again, we're, we're starting in October of 1940 for the Type 7C. So I do need to roll a 1D6 to see if I'm starting at the lowest level, uh, Ober Lieutenant or Captain Lieutenant uh, on a roll of 3 through 6. So let's go ahead and do that die roll now. Let's see what happens. So I rolled a 6, which I'm happy about because that puts me at that second level rank. So again, this is that ordinal rank, uh, level 2 out of the highest being 5. On the actual counters that you're looking at in your hand right now, that 2 was moved over actually to the left a little bit just to make sure for the die cutting uh, it wasn't cut off. So that is your initial uh, captain rating. What's interesting already about this captain rank is that you could roll a single D6 die to try to um, pick what patrol assignment you want. And if you roll a 6 on a D6, you would get to pick what your beginning patrol assignment is going to be in the game. Uh, I'm just going to basically skip that step. I want to go with the chaos theory, and I'm, just gonna, I'm basically going to find out what our first patrol assignment here is once we're done. So what's next? Well, what's next is we don't have to worry about damage for hull or flooding because nothing's happened there yet. So we're gonna, we don't have to move uh, these markers anywhere. They're just in their waiting position. Same for all our damage markers. All our damage markers are in a waiting position as well. If we look now, we've got four torpedo tubes and we've got our deck, our deck guns. If we look at our deck gun area, we see that we can have ammo, uh, up to 10 rounds of ammo. And I've actually got 10 rounds of ammo right here. And uh, per the rules, when you're in a combat round and you're at the surface against unescorted ships, you can fire off up to two rounds of ammo. So basically that means I could uh, take one of these markers right here and put it on the combat mat when I'm ready to fire. Uh, but we get to start with 10, so let's go ahead and we're just going to place all 10 of these right here in our ammo area. We have a flat gun for the 7C and it has unlimited ammo. So we don't have to worry about tracking ammunition for the flat gun against the aircraft, but uh, note that we do have a status box, whether that uh, flat gun gets damaged during play or not. So that's why that box is there. Same for the uh, status of our 88 here. Uh, we, we have that box here for display purposes as well. Now let's look at how we're going to arm the torpedoes as we get ready to go out on our voyage. So as you can see here, we start with a total of 14 torpedoes. And the beginning mix of torpedoes is G7A steam. Uh, eight of those, and six G7E electrics. And I can adjust my mix up or down by three in either direction. So let's start with the default. Uh, steam can be eight. So I'm going to start uh, placing my steam torpedoes in my four torpedo tubes. And that's, so we're going to get ready. I'm going to also put one in my aft torpedo tube. That's five out of the eight. So I've got three more. And I'm going to go ahead and add uh, my number of eight. So there's my eight steam. Now it says I can have six electric. So let's go ahead and grab our six electrics here. I can put one in the aft reloads area. Here's two more here. And I need three more right here. So there we go. So you'll note one thing I've done here is we've got separate boxes to help organize for you um, where, you know, the type of torpedo you have. So in other words, um, G7E electrics can be in this lower box, whereas the steams are in this box. And your total capacity for forward reloads is eight. So we've got eight in here. So we've got that correct. We've got the one reload for the aft. 
Uh, we should have a total of 14 now, so we're all, we're all perfect. We're all good to go uh, as far as our initial torpedo load, except for one thing. We do have a rule, which is optional, which uh, I think comes highly recommended. So I'm going to just sort of scroll to that really quickly. Uh, so excuse, the, uh, excuse me as I fly through the rules here as I go to the initial torpedo load section. So right here. So initial torpedo load restrictions. It is optional, but per the historical note, it's really a highly recommended rule, and that's why this optional rule wasn't thrown in the back where we have the rest of the optional rules. So this is coming from Greg, the designer. Again, uh, the way the G7E's electrics were designed, they required regular maintenance, etc. So what we've done here is there's a restriction for how you start your initial torpedo load. So basically the forward and aft torpedo tubes will be loaded with steam automatically. And you cannot carry more than a maximum of five uh, electrics on board. That is the maximum uh, for the um, Type 7 U-boats. That number increases to six for the uh, Type 9 U-boats. So if we look here, I'm OK. I'm within my capacity. I've got no more than five. Oh, no, I'm, I've got six electrics. I'm sorry. I take it back. I'm one over that maximum capacity. So I'm going to get rid of this one here. I'm going to go ahead and use that optional rule. Because I just want, I just want to follow the historical notes that Greg Smith, uh, Gregory's provided. So this should be my new mix. Um, and the way I've done this is, uh, is I wanted to maximize my steam torpedoes. I could have had more, I could have had more electrics up to the five. But notice here I can adjust my mix by three, which means I can have up to eleven uh, steam, and I'd have to drop my electrics down to three. So this is going to be my start. So I hope this gives you a good introduction to how you would load initially your torpedoes. I even threw in that optional rule for you here so you can get an idea basically of how you would get your initial torpedo load, uh, torpedo load taken care of. So we are, all, we are all good to go. That is all. That, are, that is the initial marker placement for the game. You are good to go. You are done. We are not placing any other markers because the rest are going to be status markers for damage or your crew status. Uh, so we're done. So we're going to start now on our first mission or patrol, so we need to find out what it is. So we go right here to our P1 U-boat patrol assignment table. And again, we're starting October 40. So we're going to be under this July-December of 1940 column. So I need to roll a 2D6 to find out the result. I rolled a 7. A 7 is British Isles. It has a note on there. It might be hard to see. Uh, a note 4. The Note 4 is the type of 70 uh, boats treat the uh, normal British Isles result as British Isles as a mine laying operation. There were very few type 70s, but they were specifically meant for mine laying operations. So again, we don't have to um, worry about that. It is a normal British Isles assignment. So if we were going back now to our, uh, to our log, to our patrol log that we have, uh, which I'll scroll to now for you here. We have it actually, we guessed right. So look, for October 40, British Isles, that is what I would be writing in to my log as my first assignment. So that actually mapped up perfectly. So how do we show that, that we're starting British Isles? We take our marker for our U-boat, and we're right here. We're going to start our British Isles uh, uh, right now. We're going to see what happens. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to find out uh, we're going to do our first transit box, and you'll notice here uh, Bay of Biscay comes up uh, in brackets. And there is a special rule for the uh, Bay of Biscay, and I want to show you just how easily that you can reference that. So uh, real quickly, to show you what I mean by that, is if we just go to the rules index in the back, we've got Bay of Biscay, we've got two incidents of it, I think it's 7.36. So let's take a quick peek at 736, if we could, real quickly here. So I can show you how quick, how quickly we can, uh, uh, 7.36. Uh, 7 so I have to scroll up. OK, Bay of Biscay. Here we go. Beginning July of 1940, uh, your first and last, possibly your last transit box, might say Bay of Biscay in uh, parentheses. Guess what? That just happened to us. So we're in October of 1940. So that's how we have to treat the first transit box. It is considered Bay of Biscay. We are basically departing uh, from the western coast of France. 
So let's find out what happens for a possible first encounter in our first Bay of Biscay box. So to do that, we now switch tables here. And you'll notice here on the encounter chart, E1 encounter chart, we're going to roll 2d6. I wish I could do this, guys. I wish I could be rolling right now on this transit chart. It's, all, it's a bit friendlier than the Bay of Biscay chart, which I have to roll on instead. I have to roll right here. And notice there's modifiers uh, for the, the date that you're out on patrol. Things are going to get a little bit more nasty for you, in other words, for an aircraft encounter. So hopefully I will not roll low. Uh, and that's, what the, that's how the modifiers would hurt me here. So let's go ahead and roll a 2d6 right now and see what happens. I rolled a 6. A 6 is great. If it was 1943, it would have been down by 2 and I would have had an aircraft result. So guess what? I am a happy guy because I do not have any type of encounter. And now I do enter a normal transit box as I'm heading towards the British Isles patrol area. So what I do now is I go back. We are now in the second travel space. And this time, I'm going to be rolling um, not in the Bay of Biscay, but we roll here in that transit box I was talking about earlier. So let's, let's roll 2d6 and see what happens. I rolled an 8. Wonderful. That's what I want. That's what we all want. We do not really want anything bad to happen. So now we are starting our British Isles. We are now out on our British Isles patrol, so we're entering that first box. So let's see what happens on our first roll. And now we're under British Isles, and now you can see where the fun starts happening, where things can start to happen. So we're going to roll 2d6. I rolled a 10. Ah, okay, here we go. Guys, the fun's about to start here. We hit a convoy. So we have a convoy encounter out on our maiden voyage, our Type 7C. So we are now going to go ahead and find out what the steps are that we have here. And by the way, I have an outline against escorted ships. So basically the rules on convoys are the following. When you have a convoy encounter, you are basically have come upon a contact upon a convoy and you're coming up with a certain aspect ratio where we're going to give you up to four ship targets, the, the four closest targets that are nearest to you. And those are the ones that you're going to be focusing on and deciding which you're possibly going to target. First thing we need to know, however, is if it's a day or night if this happened during the day or night. So we have to roll 1d6 to do that determination. So I'm going to roll that now. I rolled a 4. So uh, a 4, if we go to the charts, just to show it, well, it says right here. I could cheat and go to the charts. Um, it tells me here 4 is night time. So what I would do here is I would flip it over to night for this encounter. But let's look at the chart just so I can show you what's happening. So um, you would do this day or night roll right here. I rolled the 1d6. And there is, a favorable op there is a favorable option if you can switch to night, where you can do a night surface attack uh, at the surface, even when the ship is escorted. So uh, you might want to, there might be times you want to switch to night. There's really no reason to switch today in the game. So that would not be a, an option as commanded that I want to go from night to day. So it's really just switching from uh, day to night. So basically what happens was we just did this. So you can see that this is here. And next we have to determine our ship sizes. So we have to roll um, four times, one for each ship, to see what we get for ship sizes. So let's go ahead and do that now. And let's see what the four closest target ships are going to be. So I'm going to go ahead and roll uh, for the first target ship. Okay, the first one is four. That is a large freighter. So I'm just going to note that on a note that I rolled a, a large freighter. So I just made a note of that. Let's roll the next one. I rolled a six, which is a tanker. Let's roll two more dice for the last two ships. I rolled a six for a second tanker. I like these die rolls. And I rolled a one. A one is a small freighter, which is most likely the result you're going to get based on a rolling a one through a three. So, okay, great. We're set with that. So what I need to do now is I need to find out exactly uh, what type of target ships I'm coming up against. So let's take a look here. So first of all, um, we know we have a small freighter. I'm going to place that under target four. We have uh, two tankers. So I'm going to go ahead and grab two tankers. And you see I'm just starting now and placing them just in these swim lanes for targets. And we have a large freighter target as well. So let me go ahead and grab one of those. So I've grabbed those. Um, we're going with the basic rules. We're not going with optional escort quality rules, guys, today. 
Uh, we're going to keep this short and sweet. So we've got an escort, but there is no um, modifier. Just we know there's escorts in the area, so we just got to keep an eye out for that. So we've got escorts there. We're not part of a wolf pack mission. We don't have to worry about that. And there's no air attack going on as far as an optional rule for air quality. So this is what we've got. We've got escorts in the area. It's at night. And we've got a large freighter, two tankers, and a small freighter. What we need to do now uh, is we have to go ahead and identify or ID rather what these ships are. So what we need to do is we'll start with the small freighter, which to be honest with you right now, I'm not going to be targeting the small freighter, but let's roll the two uh, D10 dice just to find out what it was, even though I'm not going after it. I rolled a 9-0 or 90, so the black die was the 10's place. So it was uh, Wonstrecht, Wonstrecht at 4,700 uh, tons, rolling a 90. So I'm not going to target that. I'm just going to tell you that right now. It's not going to be one of my targets um, at all. It's the smallest ship. I want to focus on the, t uh, the other larger ships that I think I'm going to run into. So let's focus instead. We've got two tanker targets, guys. Let's do the tankers. So again, we roll 2d10. The first one is 33, and 33 is uh, a little bit bigger. It's the, I'm writing this down, by the way, British General. And I'm going to show you a tip on how you can write this down on your log here in a second. So I roll 33 for British General, and the tonnage is 7,000 tons. Let's do another roll for the next tanker. It's 45. 45. Ah, nice. It's bigger. It's a bigger target. It's the Charles Pratt. So I'm writing down Charles Pratt as a tanker. That was a 45 result on the dice. And what we have left is we have the large freighter to do, guys. So let's do a large freighter and we're done. So I rolled a 3. Ah, that's not, not that much bigger, is it? 7,200. Menar. Menar, 7,200 large freighter. And uh, that was rolling a three. So let me show you a tip of how typically this is done on a log sheet. So just uh, I want to share with you uh, one idea of how it is done. So let's go to the log sheet again. So what I typically recommend for the log sheet is uh, what I show here near the bottom is um, you're going to have some refit going on when you finish a patrol assignment. So usually that row, or I'm sorry, the, yeah, the row just above where you're starting British Isles will always be blank. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to know first what ships am I, am I actually going to target. So the small freighter I don't care about. So one little shortcut just to let you know on a piece of scratch paper is I could do the abbreviation T33 and T45. That means I rolled a 33 on the tanker chart, I rolled a 45 on the tanker chart, and, I, and then I would write down L, L3. I rolled three for a large freighter. So I could easily cross-reference those. And once I decide which of those three I'm going to probably target um, with a torpedo salvo, etc., those are actually the ones I'm going to log in uh, on this chart. Uh, you can log every target ship, even though you're not going to target it, but the safe space. Typically, I like a piece of scratch paper and only writing down. Uh, so an example of how that would look here is uh, just to give you an idea is, uh, so if we look at the bottom, let's look at the med. So what I have here is I have uh, in the med for December of 41, a large freighter, the Roturo, at 10,900 tons. The next one was a large freighter, the Santa Rita. If I look above that in August, I had a small freighter, that's a small S, at 3,300 tons. We had a large freighter, the Titan. We had a large freighter, the Louisiana the Tweed, a small one, and the Nelson, a capital ship. So you can see there's various ways we can basically denote uh, what the ship is that we're basically targeting. So what I need to do now is I need to come back to my combat display mat here. And I do know for the large freighters, um, if they would have been over 10,000 tons, they would take four damage uh, to sink. But I did not roll any. Uh, the large freighter I had was at 7,200. So the large freighter at 7,200 would start in the uh, under 10,000 being before sunk space. So I move the large freighter to the three spot. This means it can take three hits before it would be potentially uh, it would be potentially sunk. But I've got two tankers. I'm going to start with the British General at 7,000 tons. That's the three spot. And then my next tanker is the Charles Pratt at 9,000. So that's the same spot there. The small freighter I don't care about. I'm not going to target it. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to decide how I want to do my attack. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to do a surface night attack. A surface night attack is the only way I could be um, at the surface uh, engaging escorted ships. So that is what we're going to do. And escorted, and there's a modifier I get for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, and I, oh, by the way, I cannot fire my deck guns. You can never fire deck guns. Again, I know I'm at the surface. You cannot fire deck guns when escorts are in the area. So you can skip that part completely. No deck gun firing. That's going to happen when you have an unescorted target ship. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and I'm going to pull off my torpedoes uh, to target these ships. So I'm going to go after the Charles Pratt uh, with my um, forward torpedoes. I'm going to be throwing three at it. So I'm placing them in that uh, tor torpedo, <clears throat> torpedo area. I'm sorry, that was the wrong box. That is a small freighter box, obviously. So here's the, uh, here's the tanker, the Charles Pratt at 9,000 tons that I'm going after. And I do have at 7200 the large freighter uh, Minar. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to throw in uh, one steam there as well. Uh, so let's sort of see what happens. Now I could be a little crazy here, guys. And I guess for you I will be crazy. There is another thing I can do at the time of declaring a night surface attack. Uh, I can go ahead. And uh, I can go ahead and also fire a, a second salvo from my rear uh, aft torpedo tube. I have to declare it up front. So I'm going to do that. It's going to be a penalty to me when I do it. And just to let you know that I'm not kidding, uh, it's, in the, uh, it's in the rules here again. So when I go back here, and uh, it's for a second salvo. So let me just show you the rules on that real quickly here. So, uh, salvo, let me find, da, 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 da. it's going to be, if I don't find it quickly, we're going to move on, how's that? So, I don't have a case number right in front of me, but I'm going to try to find it. This should be right here. Exceeding test depth. I think I'm getting very close. Uh, okay, I found it. Here we go. 9.52. U-boats conducting a night surface attack may fire an immediate second salvo from the other end of the U-boat as the initial firing action. So that's what I'm going to do. It's going to be a modifier on the two hit, but I'm going to give it a shot. So that is what I'm doing. It's case 9.52. This is only possible as an option for night surface attacks. So that's why we're going for it. That's our, our rear tube right there. So we'll get to that in a moment. So we're going to start with our four, we're going to start with our first salvo, which is our forward torpedo tube. So we need to resolve that. So we, we're going to start with the uh, one lone uh, steam torpedo being fired at the large freighter. So let's go to the fire table for that. Oh, I didn't pick my range. You're right. I didn't pick my range. Uh, there's escorts in the area. Okay, let's have some fun. Um, now, I'm not going to have too much fun here. I'm going to go medium range because if I go close range, that means the escorts get to roll first before I get the initial salvo off. No way in hell I'm allowing that. Sorry, guys. Even for this, even though I'm happy you're here, I am not going to let the escorts roll to, to find me right away. So we're not doing close. We're going medium range. So thanks for the reminder on that. So let's go ahead and get started, and let's see how we do with our firing. So we've got our, uh, let's see what the fire chart looks like here. So we're not at close range, we're at the medium range. We have to look for modifiers. Um, a night surface torpedo attack. Haha, uh -huh, that's why I use this. I get, a I get a modifier that's a benefit for all these torpedoes, and we're going with it. So um, we're going to get a minus one on that torpedo. We're not firing electric, so there's no negative modifier with the plus one, plus two. And none of these other modifiers here apply yet. We will apply the second salvo torpedo modifier in a moment. So I get a minus one on the die roll for the first torpedo at the large freighter. So wish me luck. Please run a roll 2d6. Subtract one. Holy heck yeah. Okay, so that is a hit. Nice. Okay, we've got three more, uh, three more torpedoes on the tanker. Let's do those next. So we've got a hit already. Let's do the three torpedoes on the tanker next. So here we go. Seven minus one, yes, that's a hit. We've got one as a hit. Uh, seven minus one is a hit. 
guys, you're giving me good luck today. I like my luck so far. Okay, maybe it's not perfect luck, but I'm very happy with that. So let's just do the first salvo first, just to see what happens, and we'll get to the second salvo. But this is what happened. We've got a hit here. We've got two out of three hits here. We missed our mark right here, so that torpedo goes away. We lose that one, and then we've got our second salvo coming up. So we get to roll for damage next, right, guys? Is that what we get to do? Roll for damage next? No, we don't get to roll for damage next. You're right. What we have to do is we have to roll to see how many torpedo duds we have. So we have to roll for each torpedo that was a hit. We're in uh, October of 1940, so I do, not, I do not want to roll a 1 or 2. I want to roll higher than a 2. So let's roll first 1d6 for the one that hit the large freighter. I rolled a 3. That is a detonation. We have a detonation on the large freighter. We have uh, two torpedoes left <clears throat> that made contact. Let's see if they detonated. I've got a 5 and a 3. Those detonate. We've got three hits. I haven't even got to my second salvo yet. But let's just uh, focus on what happened with these for now. So we've got a hit that detonated here. We've got detonations on the tanker as well. So what we're going to do now is we have to see what damage we did starting with the large freighter. So let's go ahead and see what happens. And that's right here on the same chart. Believe it or not, trying to make it nice and easy for you guys, is we go right to the attack damage chart. It's sort of circular. We started here, went to the right, now we're down to the att uh, attack damage chart. So what we have to do now is we're rolling for the torpedo. We roll once, a single D6 for each torpedo. There's no modifiers. And let's see for the large freighter what damage we do. The large freighter took four damage. All right, well... You guys are bringing me great luck. I just sunk the large freighter. It is gone. It just went under, okay? It can only take three damage. It took four. We sunk the large freighter. Fantastic. I've got two more rolls for the tanker that we targeted. So let's roll now right here for the tanker. So I rolled a six and a three. All right, let's see what we got here. The three is two damage. The six, four or more, was one damage. We have a total of three damage, right, guys? Total of three damage. Add them together. Ah, I'm very happy about that. It could only take three damage. Huh. I'm very happy. Look at, look at this. So basically, we just, we just scored a great victory here with our... And, and you know what? I didn't even get a chance to do my, my second salvo at the large freighter. So let me just show you. If that freighter would have been around... I didn't even need it, but if that freighter had been around, I would have had that um, second salvo going in. Now, it's a night surface torpedo for a minus one, but it is also a second salvo at a plus one. Those two modifiers cancel each other out. So let's see what would have happened with the second salvo. A nine, uh, a nine would have been a miss, guys. Uh, I would have missed with that second salvo. All right, so uh, guess what? Is that it, guys? Am I done? I just, uh, yeah, that's right, the second salvo, Robert, you're right. Second salvo just got, uh, just got wasted, but you know what? You read the rule. It's, it's simultaneous. You have to decide up front if you're going to go with the second salvo. It's not like an unescorted ship. Unescorted ship is easy peasy. You get to go with the surface gunnery at first, look at the damage, see what you do. Then you can go to your torpedo, see what that does. Onward, you know, so it's very, very easy, less time pressure. So, guys, am I all done here? Uh, anybody think I'm done? Um, we can just sort of wrap it up and call it a day. Ah, crap. Okay, no. Uh, Joe Gandera says detection. I have to look for escort detection. Okay, you're right, Joe. We've got to do escort detection because we're at medium range, and that's the next step in the process here. We had escorted ships, and uh, I hate this part of the game. Actually, I love it. It's my favorite part. This is the two-player version of the game that I really like that you get to roll these uh, you get to roll these escort detections uh, basically so let's see what we have here escort detection die roll it's uh, it's a 1940 so I don't have to worry about the year I'm looking at modifiers here I didn't fire steam during the day it was not previously detected I did not do close range oh crap okay ah, night service attack ah, I'm happy about this I, I was wrong earlier so I get to correct myself because the ASTIC, the ASTIC got better, guys, um, with the escorts. Didn't happen until 41. So I do not have a modifier for the night surface attack uh, as far as being more easily detected. We have to be in 1941. So I'm happy about that. But 
Uh, yeah, so what you were saying uh, earlier, Robert, about that second salvo, uh, whether it's wasted, I wish I hadn't done it because now I've got, uh, I've got a plus one uh, modifier, which means I'm more easily detected. So um, darn it, there we go. Uh, last thing, guys, so you know is uh, there's, a, there's a rule mechanic in the game called uh, exceeding test depth. You cannot exceed test depth during a night surface engagement because you're too close to the surface, so you cannot, I cannot even attempt, attempt this yet as an option uh, to get my, uh, to get a better die roll modifier, which would give me an automatic hole hit uh, if I did that. So we just have a one, mono, I have to add one to the dice. I'm rolling two D6. I'm adding one to the dice. I rolled a six, uh, seven, okay, six becomes a seven. I'm undetected. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So this is what happens uh, next uh, based on that result. So, and it's also here, oh, I had incoming hits, I didn't, oh, that's against the U-boat, so I don't have to worry about that. So what happens is escort uh, undetected the U-boat. If all U targets have been sunk, the encounter ends. Well, no, there's still some targets out there. Basically what we have is we have a convoy. I've got no damaged ships to try to follow. If I had damaged ships, uh, I could follow them automatically and I would do a die roll to see whether they remain with their escorts or not and stay together or whether maybe they become stragglers and, and pull apart. But what I can do, uh, everybody, is I can do what's called a following action, a, a following action against uh, a convoy because I, I don't have an option anymore, uh, basically, um, to uh, do an automatic additional round of combat. Uh, none, of, none of that applies. You can only do a following action against escorted ships. So let me show that just quickly in the rules. So I'm going to go here real quickly here. And uh, let me just, actually I'm just going to scroll to the die roll area just to show you where that's at on the back page. Um, so here what we're going to do is, uh, I can't follow any damaged ships because there were none damaged, they are sunk. So following escorted ships or convoy, that's what I want to do. So I'm now going to roll a single uh, D6. Uh, it's optional. I don't have to do this. I could stop right now. Matter of fact, the attack could have been optional to begin with. I could have just ignored it. But um, I could stop and say the encounter is over and move on to the next travel space in my patrol assignment. But I'm not going to do that. I want to stay in contact with this convoy. So I need to roll a 1d6. I roll a 1 through a 4. My follow is successful. So let me roll the dice. Ah, great. Successful. So what just happened was I rolled a 1 which means I was successfully in, uh, successful in following the uh, convoy. And when you're successful in that, what happens is it's a whole new ball game. You basically get the roll to see if it's day or night, uh, what the range is going to be, what the four target ships are going to be. I could be reloaded in, in the meantime. So I'm doing my reloads now, guys, because this was, uh, again, just before the following action. Do your reloads. So I'm going to go with Steams again. Uh, so we did our reloads. We didn't fire anything here, so no, uh, nothing to worry about there. So we've reloaded our torpedoes. We've been successful with the follow. The follow means we are, again, going to go through this process again of uh, the, I, day or night. Do we switch to night? What are the four target ships? What's the range we're going to pick? So let me do this for you. What I'd like to do for the demonstration is, since we're running uh, short on time, is let's see what happens if you get detected. Let's assume I was uh, uh, detected in that attack earlier uh, that we were just doing, which means uh, my torpedoes are back down here. So the escort was successful with the detection. Okay, guys? So let's see what happens. So let's say I got a straight-up detection die roll. If I'm detected, uh, we're going to go over to this next uh, table over here where I have to roll 2d6 to see the result on the U-boat. So let's do that. So I rolled an 8. So I take two hits on my U-boat. So again, this is where, as a two-player game, if you have a friend, it's fun doing this, because this is you rolling the damage on, the guy, on your friend's U-boats. So uh, we're using the black die as the tens place. So we go here. I rolled 11. So my batteries just went out. So batteries, I've got a marker here called batteries, or I can just use my generic damage marker. Uh, you've got a choice here, guys. You can go with a, a generic marker, no name, but if you have, uh, the, again, the board game version, maybe if your table gets uh, messed up, you want to remember what was da uh, that's damage, it's batteries. So that's our first damage we took was batteries. Okay, we got one more to do. So we roll again. 
Uh, 42, a radio just went out. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Okay, so radio is out, radio is damaged. So again, that is what happens. So what happens next now is we just finished doing our damage and uh, no flooding occurred whatsoever, which was good news. So what we have to do now is we have to roll. Uh, this is the one part of the rules that I'm working with Jack Beckman uh, right now. We're going to have a, a new edition of the rules. I asked for one change. That is the concept of what's called a escort detection and depth chart cycle. Once you get detected by escorts, you are effectively in a cycle. And you cannot get out of it until you escape detection. So we now have to go right. We just finished damage. We must now immediately proceed, unless I have to um, ab abort my mission, um, we have to proceed uh, right to um, uh, our escort detection again. In other words, we don't roll yet to see if our damage becomes an inoperable system yet. We don't do that yet. That's when we're done with the entire encounter. That's when we get away from the escort. When we get away from the depth charge attacks like Boss Boat movie, you know, when you're done with that, uh, that's when you really can try to fix those things. Um, so what we're doing instead is we have to go immediately back to the escort detection. So here we go. So escort detection, what happens now? We're in a cycle. You're stuck. You don't have a choice. You have to do this. So what happens now is there's a new modifier. You were previously detected. So now we're adding a plus one to the die roll. This little nasty character right here in the middle is now in play. So we have to apply that. Um, now I have to see if anything was, uh, my fuel tanks were not damaged. Now see, I could have had a fuel tank damaged, guys. So, so I could have had a plus one just from that last round that I would have, I'd have to worry about right now. So thankfully, um, I don't, I don't have that. Um, so we're, we're good there. But you're probably noticing there's batteries damaged over here. So, you know, there's some nasty stuff I gotta worry about that's coming up. Absolutely. So what we've got now is we've got to do a, um, uh, we've, we've got to do a, uh, a plus one. Uh, the firing first, uh, the firing the forward and aft, I did that. That was the first round only. We're not in the first round anymore. This is the uh, second round effectively. So we're in a cycle. And now this is the new round for the escort. It's not for us. It's the U-boat player. It is now the second round. The, the escort now has the advantage. So this is their second round, guys. So, so again here, um, we don't have to worry about the firing forward aft. That was only the first time we did this. So what we have now is we have a previously detected. And that modifier will never be greater than plus one. So even if you get detected three, four times in a row, the modifier doesn't become plus two, plus three, plus four. It just stays plus one. So let's roll our 2d6 with a plus one. I rolled crap. <laughs> oh, okay, that's all right. I rolled an eight. Okay, well, that means I'm undetected and I get away. Uh, let's say I rolled an eight and it's a plus one because I was previously detected. So that's a nine detected. All right, nine detected puts me here on the escort air attack chart. Well, my batteries were damaged, right? So if I'm not mistaken, my batteries are damaged and my radio was damaged. Okay, guess what? You get to add plus one to that die roll. Uh, so let's go ahead and roll plus one with 2d6. I rolled seven becomes an eight. I take two more hits. So let's do our two hits, guys. 64, four, <laughs> crap. That, I, okay, so my, that's, the one, that's the one I hate. All right, this is not one you want to have happen. It's your forward for torpedo door, where all your torpedoes are. And I haven't had not a chance to reload yet. And you can basically, well, we'll have to forget about that unless we can fix it. So I'm in danger. This means I'm in danger of um, my four torpedoes never being able to fire again. So that is not a good die roll, but we don't know yet. Um, oh, I meant to roll 2d6, so hold on for a second. Let's try that right here. I rolled 34. 34 is a crew injury. I'm glad I rolled that for crew injury. Uh, so let's see how crew injury works. So for crew injury, we roll a 1d6 to find out who it is. Uh, I'm sorry, 2d6. I rolled 2d6 to see who it is. I apologize for that mistake. It's a 4. The engineer is uh, something's happening to our engineer, guys. Let's see what happened to him. Uh, he took a light wound. So our engineer is, uh, took a light injury, a light wound. So we need to mark that right here. 
with a marker so I can grab it. So here we go. We put a status of a light wound there. So what I'd like to do at this point is, um, in the interest of time, let's say we get away finally from uh, escort detection. We didn't have to worry about flooding. If we, uh, if we had flooding, we'd be doing some die rolls for that at the end, uh, etc. Uh, so let's say we just finished uh, everything. And um, so what's going to happen since we just finished is I need to roll to see if I can um, uh, repair, repair my system damage. So I'm going to start with my damaged radio, guys. So we have to go here, and we have to roll on this chart. So this means, the, this means that we escaped escort detection, and we can basically now um, find out what the status of our, oh, you're right, exceeding test step was mentioned by Joe earlier on that. Uh, since it wasn't the first round of the night surface, it was the second round, as Joe was reminding me. You, I did have the option where I could exceed it test depth, which would have given me a positive modifier, uh, minus uh, one on the die. So what we're going to do now is let's see if we can fix our radio. So I rolled a two, so the radio is fixed. So basically the radio is no longer damaged. Great result there. Let's now roll for, um, sorry, what I forgot, the batteries. So batteries is next. I rolled a five. Gosh, crap. All right, battery is inoperable. Boom, that does not come off. That's it, guys. It stays that way. Uh, no, no second chance. So what's that mean? Starting next round of combat and for the rest of my patrol assignment, whenever I am under an escort or uh, air attack on that E3 chart, I get to add plus one to the die, which you can see uh, right, uh, should be right here in the modifiers. Um, so right there. So that's the E3. Make sure I got the right chart. Yep, E3. There we go. So batteries, batteries inoperable means I get to add plus one because the batteries, even if they're damaged, by the way, it's a plus one. So uh, you know what? Uh, so yeah, so that would have been even worse for me there. I should have had an added die for the number of hits. So that's just bad news in general. So the last one's the most important. It's my four torpedo doors. This, this one's absolutely critical. I rolled a six, and oh, you got to be kidding me. Really? I'm not happy about that. Okay, so, yeah, we know what that means. So, yeah. So we've got inoperable forward torpedo door. <laughs> that means we're never going to be firing our forward torpedoes. <laughs> okay. My luck has officially wore off. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for rubbing it in. So um, at that point, I might be deciding, I, I've had a successful patrol, uh, believe it or not. So if we look here, I've actually at this point, I've had a successful patrol because I've sunk two ships. So that would be a success. And I could mark that on my roster. Uh, if I was on my roster, I would have noted the target ships and I would have circled them as destroyed. I would have noted the tonnage value. So again, on here, if I just uh, uh, switch to this real quickly. So again, on this chart right here, what I would have done with those two ships that I sunk, I would have just uh, basically, you circle, you circle the values of ships that you sink, and you can add the tonnage value here at the end of the uh, row. So whatever that tonnage value is, and you put an S at the end. Of course, that means you made it back, right, to your base. You would be uh, successful. So you would put an S there once you've had three successful missions in a row. You can roll for a crew advancement. That's why that's important. So if I wasn't on board, I could decide to abort my mission that, okay, I'm done. My torpedo doors are jammed. I'm not happy about that. I want to abort my mission. And so if I did that, my closest way back is going this way. So I would roll on the transit box, going back because I am aborting my mission. I've got my kills already. i got torpedo doors jammed. I'm not happy about that. So I'm going to go ahead and roll, roll to see what happens. So uh, transit. Let's see what we get for transit. I roll six, nothing. Then we go to the last box, back to the base. It's Bay of Biscay, Vaunted Bay of Biscay. Not happy about that because uh, the die roll can get nasty. Uh, I survived no aircraft encounter. I'm done. So I get back to my base. I'm done. I would go back here to refit. I would handle the refit rolls. Basically, you do one month of refit for sure. You can uh, basically, for free, get two systems of damage repaired for free. So this little guy goes away, this guy goes away, it didn't cost me anything. Perfect. You get to reload all your torpedoes back to the 
your next patrol assignments. You're going to be basically you're going to be at a full full stack again. And uh, so that's the great news on that. So um, the choice is you don't have to. Oh, by the way, you don't have to always go left. Uh, you don't have to go left to right when you uh, are aborting your patrol. Uh, you can when you're aborting your patrol, guys. You can go to the one that's closest to your base. You you get the pick, okay? So if I'm here, I don't know if there's one that's like if you're straight in the middle. If you're straight in the middle, the rule is you can go either direction. But here I was only right here. So what's closest? If I'm aborting my patrol, I'm not going to go through the whole patrol assignment. I'm going to go the quickest way I can get there. So uh, that's what I did, and that's uh, also you're going to find that in the rules. So if I go there real quickly, um, let me just, I've got an image of that actually, uh, just to show you real quickly what I mean by that rule. So right here, uh, when you're aborting your patrol, you would go the nearest direction. So in this case, the bottom, you're, you know, you're closer to the, what I just did, uh, or maybe you're closer just finishing the mission that way. So a little bit about that. So let me do this. We're going to take some questions here in a second. I want to stop there. Um, Again, first time doing this, I see how long it takes already at the hour mark. So let me just switch over here um, back to hopefully uh, just a slide deck for a second. So we went out on this patrol assignment. We made it back to base. I hope you get an idea uh, how the aircraft attacks work. We can cover that uh, in the Q&A uh, if you'd like. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just open it up for questions. So let me look here real quickly just for questions that have been already logged by you. So I'm going to do that first. And then if anybody uh, wants to, I'm going to put all hands down. That way if you want to raise your hand, if you want to ask a question, you can uh, use your voice and I'll unmute you. So let me go through the questions here really quickly. Uh, so what if, it, okay, what, was it a convoy or a ship plus escort, Chris asked me, that I rolled? Actually, uh, when we were looking at the game, what I rolled was, uh, I rolled a convoy result um, when we were looking at that result earlier. So I rolled a well, basically. So what's the difference between a convoy and a ship plus escort? A convoy means it's uh, four ships that you have to uh, identify the targets of. If it's ship plus or two ships plus escort, then it's two ships that you would do the target identification with. So a convoy is always under escort. Uh, no exceptions, and it always has four ships. Um, the only other escorts are capital ship automatically has an escort, and then you would have to see the escort name here in the actual label. So that's basically, and if you look here uh, in the descriptions, uh, we sort of sort of explain here, ship has escort, uh, you know, or not. So I hope that helps answer that question. Um, let's see. Uh, you're not... Uh, can you follow uh, while you're, you're still on the surface? No, the following, uh, that's a great question from Alex. So when I did that following, am I still at the surface? No, you're really actually just re-engaging that whole convoy. Matter of fact, your whole aspect of the convoy changes. So as I was successful, and, and I was successful, by the way, because I rolled well, is you would now be rolling the four new targets. You would be rolling if it's day or night. Um, you would then decide if it's surface or not. Uh, what you want to do, so it's almost like a fresh start, but it's the but you are making contact with that convoy again. It's just a different part of the convoy, so that's uh, that that that's the answer to that question. I hope that answers the question. Joe reminded me I forgot to try to exceed test depth. Um, uh, uh, there's a, a question from John. Uh, uh, Nino says the additional round of combat can be escorts or aircraft. I don't see where you roll for that. Um, so under 90, so escorts, so um, escorts, it's automatic. It's that loop I actually showed you. So when you get, when you get, um, it's really for the escorts. Think of it that way. Um, when the, it's for the escort, not for you, the U-boat player. And that's why I want to change that rule and call that a, um, I want to call that a escort detection depth charge cycle in the game. Because basically what's going on, you're getting, you're getting multiple rounds. Uh, you're getting multiple rounds when you um, do that, and we call them combat rounds. So for escorts, escorts are actually getting an additional combat round against you. For aircraft, it, it can happen also, and that's actually in the table. So I know we didn't do an aircraft attack yet, but let me show you uh, where that is real quickly here. So in an aircraft attack, what happens is, oops, didn't mean to do that. You, uh, if you miss, 
if you miss the uh, aircraft with your flak, that means you must automatically roll for additional round of combat. So that's where that's being referenced from in rule nine. So basically, while you're going under this aircraft encounter, at the same time, simultaneous, you're trying to shoot down, that's that green chart, you're trying to shoot down the aircraft. And if you roll six or more, and if you miss it, what that means is you have to roll, I'm going to show you what you have to do right now. You have to roll, if you miss the aircraft completely, you have to roll right here, additional round of combat table on the encounter chart, which means if you miss that aircraft, there's a good chance that aircraft is going to circle around and bite you in the butt again, or even uh, aircraft has called in, radioed in some escorts to the area. So if you do not, if you miss that aircraft, you must roll here after whatever ha has happened with that aircraft. So I hope that makes sense. Um, blah, 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 blah. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, plans for an expansion that would cover beyond 1943, Scott. That's correct. So the expansion for the Hunters uh, right now, and it could change just to let you know, but right now the expansion for the Hunters, uh, we're going to do a few things. Uh, we're going to go beyond 43 for sure. We're also going to have the Type uh, type 2 U-boats at the beginning of the war. We're doing that as well. Um, we're also um, going to be adding some counters. Uh, so the ship counters will be um, extra, basically what will happen, <laughs> this is a little crazy, but we're going to do it, um, but it might change, is we're going to print out all those counters for on the target roster, not the optional ones, but all the target ships. Uh, so if I show you really quickly here how that would work. Um, for again this, is, again, this is for the expansion, so you get a lot of, so we want to give you a lot of goodies for the expansion, basically, is what we're doing. So look at the basic target roster, not the optional one. You've got 100 targets. Right? So what you're going to get is you're going to get 100 counters. And the way it's going to work is it's not the nightmare scenario that you're thinking. It's not like you roll the, the 2d10 and you have to look up the value and, oh, my gosh, where is, I rolled a 37. Where is the star cross in my pile of 100 counters that are all over my table? This is not going to work. It's going to take forever. You wouldn't do it that way. And, again, this would be optional to you once you have these counters. What you would do instead, and you've probably guessed it already, is you're going to put the 100 counters in a cup. That cup is your small freighter cup, or it's your large freighter cup, or it's your, your tanker target cup. And you're going to pick those counters out of the cup, and voila, they are going to have the name of the ship, the tonnage value. You don't have to worry about rolling the die anymore. You don't have to deal with these charts even for the targets anymore. It all becomes automatic. So it's, it's basically like uh, Chris is saying, it's a chip pool. It's like a chip pool system. Exactly right, Chris. So we're doing that as well. So um, the last thing we're going to do, which is something that's available uh, from the website, which somebody did, and that is we're going to have probably a half map size or A3 size uh, map. So instead, instead, of, um, instead of something uh, that looks like this, let me just show you for the expansion. So you're you would still you would still get these um, U-boat displays that look like this. This is our tried and true U-boat display. It's going to look like this. But what you will get is we're going to hand we're going to give you a supplement that you can use, which will be just for patrols. And imagine if you will, somebody did this already, and it's posted in our downloads area. It's a small map board that shows the actual zones, like what's in the background here, those little square grids where we have interconnected boxes. So you get a geography. You get sort of a spatial recognition of, okay, where am I in my patrol? If I'm in the mid, where am I on the map? And you follow those circles and you move your U-boat on a map of in the ocean, right, where you are. So um, that is something. So as you can see, we're adding a lot. Uh, we're planning to add a lot. Um, we're also going to add, add Italian U-boats. So we're also adding the Italians um, to the expansion for the Hunter. So all that is being worked on, but uh, right now what we're going to be doing is we're working on Silent Victory, which is the Pacific uh, version, the U.S. Submarine, US Submarine War 1941 through 45. Um, at this point, what I'd like to do is, does anybody have their, uh, would anybody like to ask me a question? Um, I've talked enough today, so I just want to see if anybody wants to raise their hand. So just click on the, um, all right, Tim, I'm going to, I see you want to ask a question, so I'm, I've, un, I've unmuted you, Tim. Uh, okay. I just wanted to know, when it comes to a capital ship that's a CV, 
Do you do a separate air attack, or is that just a regular escort attack when you um, when you go after that ship? Yeah, uh, if you've got the CV, treat it like any other capital ship. Um, that's exactly how you treat it. There's no special rule for our aircraft per se. So you, as a U-boat commandant, you are going to be going after it uh, full bore. You're probably going to risk close range. Um, I'm going to put you just on mute for a second because I'm getting feedback. So just as the rules are written, uh, Tim, great question. Uh, you're going to go pretty aggressive against any capital ship because it's automatic knights. Uh, in most cases, it's the automatic knights cross as a medal if you sink it. There's five of them out of the ten. But if you even if you don't get the medal right away, the amount of tonnage value you get is going to probably push you over the top, the 100,000 tons sunk for the Knight's Cross. So great question about the CVs. Um, so let me see. Does anybody else have a question they want to ask uh, about the game or anything else in general? So I'll just wait for another uh, five or ten seconds here to see if anybody wants to raise their hand. All right, so what I'd like to do uh, just uh, – oh, Alex had a question real quick. Thanks, Alex. What's your question, Alex? Uh, just real quick, sir. Um, the Sun Tzu uh, module there, I didn't see a 20-sided die for the North American. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, we're going to update that. So there's. Uh, so do you know what the workaround is? Did you see the errata sheet? Uh, um, not yet. Okay, so there is. Um, let me just show you really quickly, guys, because um, this is important because I do want to mention – um, on our website, so we're, we are posting news stories daily um, that right now is, uh, by the way, there's one of the great displays right there uh, for the Hunters. Somebody did, but it's very large. Um, so what we've got here is if you go to the Hunters product page, can you see the screen, by the way, Alex, right now that I'm uh, going through? Uh, yes. Okay, so what we have here besides the tutorials we've done, we have, uh, if you go to the downloads page, which I'm highlighting now, we have our errata sheet. We have a well. Actually, we have a lot. <laughs> we have we have like 15 different downloads, but I want to draw your attention to the errata sheet. So I'm just going to uh, pull that up real quickly here, just to bring it to your attention. So let me go ahead and bring that up here real quickly. And what you can do, while well, we don't have a D20 in Sun Tzu, and again, it's just a one pager. So okay, so the target roster we realized. Uh, okay, we don't. It will, it's really a 1d20 you need to roll. So there is a workaround. You can use a d6 and a d10, and we sort of explain here how you do it. So first you roll a d6 on a roll of a 1 through 3. It's going to be using the low range or 1 through 10 range. If you roll a 4 through 6, you're going to treat it as a high range, 11 through 20. So whatever you roll on that last d10 will tell you if it's the low range or the high range. So we can work around. <laughs> you can use Sun Tzu to work around the problem as we have explained it here. So... Uh, we, so we do have the serrata. The good news is most of it are clarifications or additions that the designer wanted. Uh, so they're just, I'd say 75% you see in here are clarifications or additions uh, to the game. So I just want to draw everybody's attention um, to our website. We have every, every download imaginable is on our website today uh, that you can do, um, as well as our uh, tutorial screencasts uh, that we have that you can go to here. So we have a nine tutorial screencasts, including how to use the Sun Tzu box. Um, so, so great question, Alex. I hope that answers your question about that. And okay, so what I'm going to do is we went a little over, so I just want to thank everybody uh, for your time today. I really appreciate you also being patient with me. It's been a long time uh, since, again, we've been any type of a webinar broadcast, which has been recorded. Uh, it's been a, a real pleasure working on this project uh, with Gregory Smith, Jack Beckman, uh, the host of uh, Proofreaders and Playtesters. I just want to let you know that we're uh, actively working right now on Bear's Claw, which is on the P500. Uh, if you go to GMT, you'll see Bear's Claw at around 360. And uh, we've upgraded the components to a large full-size map and larger counters. And we'll have new box art from Roger McGowan. So we're looking forward to hopefully pushing the, uh, that to the P to that 500 level. In the meantime, we'll have some pre-order announcements in January. Uh, we'll be announcing Silent Victory on the P500, which is the U.S. submarine war in the Pacific from 41 to 45. So, fans of the Hunters uh, will be uh, announcing in January the Silent Victory game. Uh, so that will be uh, the next official P500 uh, announcement in January. And again, we have Bear's Claw. And we, like I mentioned already, we are actively going to be working on the expansion 
for the hunters, and that will be announced later. So again, I want to thank you all so much for joining, taking time out of the holiday season here. So I hope you enjoyed this session, and it was a real privilege to have you. I will be going through all the attendees, and we will be giving away a coffee mug to one lucky person who attended, and I will be announcing and emailing that person uh, since I have your email from the registration. So I want to thank you for attending. I wish I had 50-plus uh, coffee mugs to give out today. Uh, but we'll give we'll definitely give one out to you. And again, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate your time today.